Welcome to the Outhouse Lounge, where we relax and talk about things. Don't need that new tagline. Despite what the music and radio industries want you to know, rock music did exist at some time. And I mean rock. I mean good, solid rock. With people who could play and groups who could, well, rock. With me is someone who was immersed in that world, has played with legendary groups, and has worked on preserving some of the great history of rock and roll. Welcome to the Outhouse Lounge, Nancy Quattro Glass. Hi. Hi, Nancy. You were a member of both the Pleasure Seekers and Cradle, working with your sisters. The Quattro is a longtime music family. What was it like? Let's start with the early years. What was it like growing up with such influences around you? Crazy, to put it really bluntly, really crazy. Um, amazing. Every everything I can think of to say it was um, because the girls started Pleasure Seekers. I was the youngest of the family, so I was only twelve when they were really going at it. Uh, so I didn't, I didn't, I wasn't in the band, but I certainly got to see, hear them practicing. And my brother was also in the music business at that point, so he was he was off doing his thing with all the Detroit bands, um, meaning. Uh, managing, promoting, putting on rock shows. So I, uh, what I did was I babysat for him. And that's actually where I met Bob Seeger, Ted Nugent, all the, all the ones that were really getting a name in Detroit. And it was a huge, um, Pleasure Seekers was more of like a cover band, fabulous and did a great job. Uh, but by the time I was ready to join, which was 15 years old, I literally quit quit high school. We went, Susie came down, asked me to sing with her to harmonize in the basement. I did a song and went, she promptly went right up to my father and asked him if I quit school. And he looked at me. I, it, it wasn't really quitting school because I never went anyway. Oh, so, there you go. So. <laughs> I was one of those. I school was prison to me for me. I was a free spirit, rebellious, blah blah blah. I so, always like to annoy my teachers in school. They were they didn't like having me in there because they knew I was going to start some uh, not not real trouble. I, I was just pretty annoying. Yeah, I just I just hated it. I felt like I truly was in prison. So she asked him, and he looked at me, and he said, and he was a musician. Uh, I mean, he worked at GM in the day, but he was a musician at night. And he asked me, will this make one vital question? Will this make you happy? And I said, yes. And he said, okay, that was it. Went the next day and quit school. And so I joined Pleasure Seekers as the lead singer. And uh, Susie, who was the lead singer, she just went to, you know, really honing her bass craft. And um, uh, then we changed the name to Cradle. Uh, because music was much heavier, getting much heavier. You know, that was Cream and Led Zeppelin and blah, blah, blah. So we changed it uh, to Cradle, our name. And that's when, that's really my journey is more in Cradle than Pleasure Seekers. So you start Cradle. What was the plan for that? You guys weren't the same kind of cover band the Pleasure Seekers were. I don't think we, I don't think we had a plan because back then music, was so all over the place in a good way with the creativity. I mean, you could go to you could go to a club, uh, or I mean, like East Town or Grandy Ballroom, and you would have so many different genres of bands. Where now it's like genre based. If if there's a lead rap band, then the rest that are going to be before them are going to be rap bands. This was BB King with Led Zeppelin. I mean, you could see across the board different styles of music. So I don't think Cradle had a plan at all other than to create and kind of see where it would lead us musically. And we definitely were led, if you're going to go by genre based, we we went from, we were very esoteric in some ways. So we've got the real heavy, but we've got the lighter and um, just exploring. It was, it, that was the era of explore, exploration for music. No doubt about it. Which was good, but there weren't a lot of all-female bands at the time. There were basically none, and what there really were none of was anyone that played hard rock. 
No, not a lot. A lot of women were relegated to doing ballads and maybe on occasion you had your outliers like your uh, honey land trees and the, and the, and the honeycombs who was an yeah. outstanding drummer. People don't realize how good she was, but there are, there's some YouTube footage of her just jamming. Uh, you yeah. had, uh, yeah, Janice Joplin, you had Linda Ronstadt, but there wasn't much around uh, or at least women weren't allowed to do that. And I'm sure many wanted to. If you were hard rock, like you mentioned Joplin, you were relegated to being a singer, but an all female group that's actually writing their own music that was unheard of and on top of that playing their instruments in a hard rock form <laughs> that just i really don't know of any that were as hard rock as we were i mean it's what you would call it now i didn't have a title for it back then what we were genre wise but hard rock is absolutely what we would have been considered now probably and now there isn't really such a thing as hard rock anymore I'm, i'll get into that with you later on because that, that's a whole other set of uh of, uh, of a bag of worms that we could talk about here. Yeah. Let's keep with uh, what you were doing with Cradle and uh, and talk about how, you're, how you and your sisters put together some great music. I want to put some of this in a perspective. First off, you all played your own instruments. You played a plethora of them. Mm -hmm. well, let's, I let's, did. Yeah, let's, let's hear a list. <laughs> okay, so uh, I played bass, uh, piano, uh, cello, violin all all in the band because we had songs that it fit um tim Bally's, you know i did a little of everything to tell you the truth as it should be nancy you have to play a lot of instruments if you want to put a great band together you would grow up in a very musical family so it would turn out that way anyway you have your musical parents your musical siblings a lot of people know susie and your other sisters but you had a brother mike who was also very musical very uh actually one of my earliest memories our house was filled with music i grew up in a very music filled house but one of my earliest memories is my brother got picked to go to hollywood and be on what was then an incredibly popular show the lawrence welk show and he got picked to play piano on uh in the junior band so he was on national tv and i was five years old and we had the black and white tv and we were all in the den and my dad said, okay, everyone, you know, don't talk because it was about to start. I didn't know what we were talking, what they were even telling me to shut up for. But all of a sudden my brother comes <laughs> on the TV and I actually made the cut. I said, what's Mickey doing in that box? I, I, <laughs> yeah, how did he get in there? But that was my first introduction to my brother and um, where he would actually head because he, if you're going to pare it down, my brother is without a doubt the most talented musician in the family, and all my sisters would agree with that. You were working on a, a, a documentary about your brother. I want to get into that in a little bit, but let's get back to you as a singer. We'll get to, we'll get to your brother pretty soon. Okay. And this is taken from the Quattro Rocks website. You were called the mover of the group, the sensual bitch goddess. Can I say that? Can I say that on the air? I'm going to find out if I get demonetized. That's what happened. I'm reading this word for word. YouTube police. Yeah. The focal point of every male in the crowd. That must be nice. <laughs> when she's singing, the microphones grasp firmly in both hands, lips almost kissing it, feet wide apart, head flung back triumphantly in opera fashion. I, I, this is really dramatic. I like. I like this. Long brown hair flowing down her shoulders. Body. Wow. I. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I need a shot i ended a little, little cold water let me finish the quote here now, there we go <laughs> nancy quattro glasses with me on the outhouse lounge let's continue the quote body never remaining stationary for a minute that i like because you really can't just stand there and sing that's not fun even during the instrumental break she's moving Prancing cat-like back and forth, arms floating rhythmically from her sides, pelvis pulsating with every beat, moving with the grace and beauty of a wild beast stalking its prey. Wow. That, that, that's a rave review from 1971. Yeah, that guy was, uh, he actually rode in with us to some of our gigs, and I wonder whatever happened to him, actually. But he was definitely into me. Yeah, I was going to say, is he trying to get a date with you or something? <laughs> yeah, I, he was kind of interested. I mean, I never, ever lived down the sensual bitch goddess. And I always used to laugh and say, well, you got the bitch part right. I don't know about the sensual, but he was. <laughs> 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 uh, 
he was really uh, in love, I must say, because, yeah, that 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 followed me everywhere. I guess he was hoping to be the prey you were stalking. Yes, I guess so. <laughs> <laughs> you also got the compliment, a female Robert Plant. Mm -hmm. That's a distinct voice. Mm -hmm. But where, you, do you see that? Yes, I see why that was said. I got compared to uh, Hart, too. Uh, what's her name? Nancy Wilson. There you I go. got I got compared to her because people are always going to compare no matter what. You know, you're trying to get a context of what someone sounds like if they haven't heard you before. So Robert Plant, yeah, definitely one of them that I, and I do see it. Uh, I had a very, I don't have it anymore, but I had a very high range. I could go real high. And I was operatic trained. My mom put me in opera when I was 10 years old for two years. And I did excel at it. And I think uh, because of that, I think that's why my range was ridiculously wide. And it, and breath control. I could hold a note so long that I don't even know how I did it. I couldn't do it now. But uh, so the opera helped me. It helped me hone my skill. Interestingly, there were quite a few opera trained singers. Uh, Pat Benatar comes to mind. That does help. It's it's good to have a, a lot of people say, well, rockers can rock. They don't realize there's a lot of talent that goes into uh, singing, especially in an era and the sixties and seventies were that era where rock was uh, advanced musically. Yes. Yeah, no, I, I agree. Um, I think people don't realize how much work it actually is takes to sing and how much skill you really do have to have. And breath control is probably the biggest part of it. And where you sing from, because if you sing from your throat, you're not going to last. You have to sing from your diaphragm. So what? Uh, for a little while there, I was giving uh, singing vocal lessons to, I had some students and I had one that literally she, because I had a whole system of how I would do it. And she, she'd get done and just say, oh my God, I mean, I had no idea because it's not easy. And in my opera training classes, there were a couple of times I actually fainted with my teacher. I fainted. fainted. Yeah. You, you, you don't learn any other way. You have to push yourself to the limit. Can you do yeah. the Kill the Wabbit song? That's my favorite opera song. <laughs> I don't think I could do any of it anymore. It's amazing how <laughs> when you age, how your voice changes anyway. Uh, I know I don't have the range anymore. But you do talk through your diaphragm, and that's what I have to do. They train us radio people to do the same thing. You don't want to. You don't want to hear a guy talking like this, yeah. yeah. Unless he's doing voiceovers, yeah. Or or if it's Rick Dees doing the duck voice for Disco Duck, that's a different story for a different day, right? <laughs> With me is Nancy Quattro Glass on the Outhouse Lounge. Both the pleasure seekers and cradle became important parts of music history, Nancy. And this was a time before the Runaways, a time when all female bands, as we kind of touched on before, who played their own instruments were unheard of. You had vocal groups. Those were cool. And I love my girl groups. How did some of your male counterparts treat you at the time? Most women were singing the lighter pop bear, not rocking it out. And I'm not one of those wokey types, as you know. But women were not exactly respected as hard rockers at the time, aside from, as we mentioned, a few outliers. Yeah. What's funny to me now is when I look back, um, I personally didn't feel the whole uh, girls aren't doing this, girls don't do this. I didn't feel any of that because my my parents, my dad especially, never raised us to think that there was anything we couldn't do, ever. So it was never even in my mindset, you know, that girls don't do this. It didn't come to my mind until guys started commenting on the fact that we were girls. Like like we would hear, you guys are really good for girls. <laughs> you guys are good for and, girls. And then you want to just punch someone out. You know, you <laughs> punch the light. good for girls. Okay. It's so condescending. But that we heard, I'd say every gig we played, we would hear that. You guys are good for girls. And since I have to be careful what I say, I will tell you what my sister, I could tell you what my sister Patty said, uh, that Leslie West from Mountain, the guitar player from Mountain, he was right there. He was a big fan of ours. Yes. And he was right there when this was said in Patty's reply. And he never forgot it. He he used, even when he was uh, being interviewed on Howard Stern, he brought it up because <laughs> it was such a good line, but it's the D I C K word. Oh, oh okay. Uh, that would be a tough one. We'll have yeah. to use a, uh, we'll have to use a, a euphemism for that. How about, uh, um, 
uh, member, as Buddy Hackett I'll used to say. say I'll just say blank. Uh, he, <laughs> the guy said, you guys are really good for girls. And she said, suck my blank. Oh, there you go. Of course, uh, you might get you might get in trouble for saying that today, <laughs> especially if you're a female, because then there'll be like somebody saying, "Oh, wait a minute, you you hurt my feelings," or some kind of uh, yeah. alphabet thing or whatever. Oh, oh, that's another thing we can get into for a different time. <laughs> but you have to come back at these people for uh, saying, "Well, you're 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 pretty good at driving for a girl. You're pretty good at playing guitar for a girl." Uh, I, mean, it's like, well, I get that there was no reference really other than comparing to a male, I get that. So I, I try to keep things in balance and I did even then. But I remember it was like a wake up call, like, wait, we're good for girls? I didn't know there was an issue about it, but there was. Uh, and even record labels, I mean, if you, even if we got some look-sees from what record labels, they want you in a short skirt, and we went through a period of time where we were wearing blue jeans and t-shirts, like trying to not show that we're girls so much. Then we said, forget that. And we started dressing exactly how we want to dress, whatever that is. Uh, so we forgot the jeans and t-shirts unless you actually wanted to wear it. Cause we saw, we found ourselves starting to cater a little bit to, you know, well, we want to play down that we're girls and I'm rebellious. So I'm thinking I'm not playing that down. I am a girl. I happen to play music, you know, uh, but I don't know. I just, it just never affected me, but it, it, you were aware of it when it came to label time with, you know, a possible interest from labels, how they wanted to change you, how they wanted you to look and, and but labels do that to guys too. They, they do. And the way they package men and women today right. is yeah, it's really exactly. disgusting in a lot of ways. It is. Why wouldn't, why, why are they calling you rockers, not feminine? Why wouldn't a record company want somebody who's, I'm going to read it again, whose uh, arms floating rhythmically, rhythmically from uh, her sides, <laughs> pelvis pulsating with every beat, moving with the grace of a beauty of a wild beast stalking its prey. If that's not feminine and, and uh, cool for a record company. I, I don't know what these people were thinking. You know what though? I think record labels are not very innovative, especially back then. They're not very innovative and that someone didn't have the foresight to see there is no one like this out there. This would be the first female capitalize on it, but they didn't. That's what I would have done. Cause I, I consider myself a talent finder. I would have, I would have locked into that, that, Hey, th this is like fresh and new with, there aren't girl rockers. Let's, let's go for this. And you were out of a scene, the Detroit music scene, which was innovative in and of itself. There was oh. several, several new uh, genres coming out of there. Most famously, obviously the, the Detroit rock and the, uh, and the Motown, which kind of split off from there. Yeah. So, wh so why not? Why not get something innovative, like an all female rock band that actually yeah. rocked? Yeah. And didn't look bad. <laughs> we, weren't, we weren't unattractive you know what i mean so if, if you're gonna go that shallow way i mean it, it it was a whole package to me exactly but you're always fighting the men in suits so right right they're, they're again a lot of these guys are afraid of being fired so convention is the way to go it's not yeah. easy or maybe taking something a little different and pulling it back to convention that's that's what they do yeah. Unfortunately, a lot of regular people miss out on a lot of great talent that way. I agree. Nancy, quick question. In the Detroit music scene, I know we talked about the how the guys treated you, but how do the audiences treat you as a uh, as an all-female band out of Detroit? I think, first of all, what you really have to understand in that era is everybody was stoned out of their minds. Not us, but I mean... <laughs> Oh, of course, yeah. I mean, I could get high walking into the venue, honest to God. It was just, drugs were a big deal. Um, and the audiences uh, were definitely receptive. They were receptive, mostly the men. But I think the men were receptive and yelling things like, hey, show us your, you know, your, your boobs. Mm -hmm. You know, we had to win them over. Bottom line, we had to win them over because we were girls. We talked about your brother a little while ago. You sang for his band. He had a booking agency at the time as well. He 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 had the booking agency first. Uh, he has quite an interesting life. But the booking agency was incredibly successful. He put on lots of pop festivals. 
He was the first one to bring Jimi Hendrix to that side of the country. Uh, he was kind of considered the Billy Graham of the East, you know. Um, but he had, uh, he put on so many pop festivals. And that's where I really got an introduction to the bigger band, you know, because obviously I went to every one of the shows, all his shows. Uh, but my brother's, um, he was a powerful influence on the Detroit music scene really powerful um and some of the bands actually still write to me and they'll tell me things like you know he's the only one who actually paid us and that's important a lot, a lot yeah. of a lot of bands are ripped off at the time we talked we heard about a lot of things that happened to the motown bands i did talk to one of the one of the people from the delphonics uh, one of the gentlemen from the delphonics who started his own record company maybe five to ten years back for the sole purpose of treating artists fairly yeah They've been through all this stuff, uh, so it's good to have guys like your brother in the um, in, in yeah. the industry. You working? You were working on a documentary about him, uh, and it sounds like it's an important piece of uh, of video that we all should be seeing. Yeah, it's um, real important to me. It was what I would call one of my biggest passions, and I have not finished it, and haven't even come close to finishing it. Uh, I had investors. The real story is. It's, it's my, I own it. So it's mine. Um, and when it's about my family, if it's something that's about my family, which is near and dear to my heart, even if it's got some, uh, ugly stuff in it, you know, not pleasant things in it. Um, it's a tr the truth. So I wanted it only put out there as the true story. And my brother was completely compliant with doing this. And he knew that it was going to get real raw, gritty and dirty because his life is real raw, gritty and dirty and wonderful all at the same time. So he had agreed and I did have investors. We went to Detroit and this was to be a documentary, nothing to do with Hollywood. Just I, I, I wanted to get it done and tell the truth. It was in some ways therapeutic for me as his sister, because I'm, I was the closest one to him. I was home the longest. I was a big part of his life. The the doc his life has so much uh for lack of a better word, scandal. Uh so many things that he was a part of that weren't good, and then so many that he that were good, but it, you couldn't write the story. That's all I'm telling you. You couldn't write this story. And it really happened, it's real life. So I went there and uh with the film crew and we did I did the interviewing of my brother and then we did all the location shots. Um and my investors decided that they wanted to go to Hollywood and they wanted to, because one of them had some real, you know, he had connections. They wanted it to be a movie instead of a documentary. And I said, absolutely not. That was because I have a lot of integrity and it's mine. So no. And we talked about it. I said, I get because you think this could really be something. I get that, but it has to come out first because I know what Hollywood does to reality. Oh, yes. <laughs> You're not doing that with my family. Uh, and they actually were, they were close to getting a deal, came back and told me that, and I promptly said, I'm done. I'm done. You can't have it. It's mine. It's copyrighted. You know, it's I own it. Uh, and I was done with them because to me, um, who I'm in bed with, they better have integrity. And they were going totally, they were seeing the dollar signs. And you know what? I told them, I said, if Hollywood, if this documentary comes out and Hollywood truly wants to make a movie out of it, I'm not going to care then because I already told the truth. They can ruin it all they like, <laughs> but I already put out the truth. It's like that book versus the movie thing, documentary versus the movie. The truth is in there somewhere. The Hollywood version, well, it's embellished so the masses will come see it and they'll be like, wow. That's, that's incredible. And there's a few that'll check out the documentary and say, hey, wait a minute, the movie left this out, or the movie didn't say this, or that's not how it happened. Now I see. But at least you'll have that there. I really I really do understand what you're what you're trying to do. I, and I know the temptation of making the big bucks is there, but we also know how pretty, how awful Hollywood has been. Yep. No, thank <laughs> you. Yeah, yeah, you wouldn't, you wouldn't, you wouldn't trust the, you wouldn't trust these guys as far as you can throw them. And I don't think they no. want to go to Manitoba. No. <laughs> I agree. I no, it, it, this was so near and dear to my heart, and it still is. Uh, and the fact is, is my brother's 80 now. 
So I was in a hurry to get moving on this because I'm sorry, the clock's ticking. And uh, for me, it was, you know, I got to get this done. And while he's still of sound mind and blah, blah, blah. And the interviewing, the, the process was fabulous and it turned out incredible. I was real proud of it. Um, the location, everything, just how the story was unfolding. But I had the whole ending. I had it all planned out where we were doing. The ending is so powerful that I know that the that at the end of this, if I had like made it to Netflix or whatever, if it got finished, that <laughs> I would have gotten really good reviews because it really was, it made me want to become a documentary maker, actually. Well, there you go. The only problem is they'll be saying, well, Nancy says all sorts of mean stuff on social media. We can't put her on, uh, on Netflix. Oh, yeah, no. you know, I, I could care less and we'll never <laughs> I, I and I will never care about any of that. But well, you know what that would do? It give you good publicity, and people want to buy and see the documentary. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. What well, I mean, and it's a good story. It's not like it's you know that's the important part. It really is a good story, and it's worth a watch. But it, and you have that same perspective in a lot of ways too, because not only was your brother a talent agent and a booker, you also managed talent. I did. I did. Um, I've always considered myself a talent finder. If I could live my life over, I would have probably definitely gotten into producing and I would have moved in a different direction. But yeah, uh, I got bands on national tours and, and you know, I, I, one in particular um, that I, my heart, if I'm into it, I'm into it full throttle. And I was into this one particular band it was my son's band uh and not because he's my son because if he sucked i'd say it and i wouldn't manage him but they were <laughs> they, they really were it's tough love yeah well i just i wouldn't lie to my kid and tell him you're great if you're not i would tell him maybe you look at a different field you know you're, this isn't your thing but i knew from age five he was going to be a drummer it, it passed down to Susie's son uh he's a um guitar player oh him he, i've heard yeah i've heard him he's yeah and then um so the grandchildren some of the grand or our kids have carried on at least with the talent part of they they inherited that my my sister susie's daughter laura sings really well and then uh my son michael my two girls they're more artistic but they're creative one was more into acting don't speak too loud because your family is so talented that somebody in the government's going to come after you and force you all to redistribute that talent to the rest of us who are untalented. <laughs> yeah, I I loved I loved that whole life, the creative part of it. Um, and it's weird to go into the normal sector where you're doing like normal jobs, even though I am like right brain, left brain. I'm both. <laughs> I prefer the creative, but it's hard to make money creative. I'm with you on that. I've been in radio for a long time. I know the answer to all of that. Yes. However, uh, you're, a, again, a talent seeker. So what kind of talent, what what do you think would make a, a good band that uh, Nancy Quattro Glass would say to herself, hey, let me take this group or this artist under my wing and, and bring them to the forefront? That's really hard because I will tell you, till this day, people send me music on my private messenger all the time. <laughs> all the time and please give this a listen i don't even know how they know to send anything to me but they do and within probably i don't know not even a full minute of a song i'm either turning it off or i'm just like okay no no thank you no 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 yeah that's mine i'm sorry that, that was mine i i have greatly apologized for that crap that i sent you oh that was not <laughs> And then I'll have, but then something will maybe make me go three minutes just to kind of see, okay, it got me a little bit, but it's almost immediate for me personally. If a song grabs me instantly, then I, I really will sit and listen. And then, and I'm a weird listener because I listen overall and then I'll go back and I'll listen uh, to just the singer. Then I'll listen to just the guitar player. I want to hear, then I'll dissect what's each instrument doing. but. Um, now it would be, I'm definitely more hard rock. I always have been, always will be, even though I love all genres except rap. I'm not a rap girl. Uh, but there's even a few rap songs I actually do like. Um, I think it'd be really hard 
to find what I would call a great band coming from the era I come from today. It'd be hard. Back in that era, and you were saying it was a very uh, discovery type era, uh, performative, if you will, with music too. You had the uh, the luxury of the FM band at the time. It was experimental. It was the alternative to the popular AM uh, radio band. Longer songs were allowed to be played. You could make more symphonic rock, and that became very, very popular. It was the open, uh, the opening, and the advent, or or the 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 precursor to the advent of album oriented rock. Something we do not see anymore today, and I contend we need badly. Yeah, I agree with you. Um... It's funny because when I was managing my son's band, which is now 15 years ago, when I was managing them, I would ask, there were quite a few local bands here in Dallas. Uh, we had a very great music scene back then. And there were, I would love talking to the young musicians and ask them, uh, like, who are your influences? Just because I got to know them all. We were always down, you know, with the music scene. And it was amazing to me, almost, I, I, well, actually, I don't I think I ever heard from one of them that didn't say my era. Not one of them. Jimmy Hendrix, you know, like they would name the guitar, who their actual influences were. So that era influenced all music, completely. I mean, just look at what was coming out of there when the Who did the rock opera. That made, uh, everything back then was so experimental that some songs were 20 minutes. Drove me nuts as a singer. I oh, actually yes. hated it because I'm standing on the stage like, okay, are we done jamming? But <laughs> I mean, really, as a singer, it's actually not fun. Well, but, you need that glass of water in between. That, okay. That's what you guys should have done. Had a nice glass of water sitting there just in case you had those 15 to 20 minute songs. DJs, we play those. We call them bathroom songs. Yeah. This way you play the, when we had records and CDs, you played them, they can get up and go to the bathroom and come back and nobody would ever notice. I just gave away the secret, but I'm pretty yeah. sure we all figured that one out. Yeah. And we did write one. We, after who did that, we wrote what's called dream. It's on, on the cradle CD. We wrote our version of a rock opera and it was very creative. Um, I personally loved it. We even bought timpanis to have timpanis in there because we we were so experimental. We wanted the uh, some in some parts orchestra sound. Um, I'm a big orchestra girl. Uh, oh, me too. I'm, I'm an orchestra guy. I yeah. like my. I play low brass instruments, so I, I listen for for I, I, any any rock band with a brass section makes me happy. Any uh, orchestra where it's where where the the music the classical music is uh, strongly bass orient uh, excuse me a brass oriented again i'm in yeah and here's the thing for me like if you talk about nowadays music um i can maybe count on one hand what who i would say for me personally that i think are either did one song that i thought was off the charts incredible um uh disturbed is one of the people that i think when they covered simon and garfunkel's sounds of silence the video, the because people hear music with their eyes now too. You know, video is obviously you listen with your eyes also. Uh, but I can only name not that many bands that I would say to me in this era of music are just extraordinary. My era, I don't think I, I, I don't think I could think of them all. There were so many. That's because they were allowed to exist back then. Yes, Nowadays, right. and I've contended this with a bunch of my guests in the past so i'm going to throw it at you today i believe music has turned into a science a way to uh, 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 uh let's say light up somebody's endorphins so they go out and dance and uh and and shake drinks around and yell woo on yeah. the on, on the floor and hopefully buy the downloads it's it's no longer album oriented i know there are some outliers out there and you don't see them in the pop charts or it's a rare occasion where some kind of sneak through yeah um, but they even take talented people, wrap them up to look pretty, sync their range, even if they have good range, they sync their range to a, a couple of octaves, uh, if, if that, and keep a few different chords. And I love my I love my uh, three chord bands. Don't get me wrong, but, but that was a whole different story. That was creative, and you can do different things with it back. And this is all just the five three five millennial whoop, a couple of chords that uh, that spark people's I don't know. I guess uh, will to will to dance, pick up a drink, and buy a download, and that's it. 
that's all it is. And the radio, it, it you turn it on, pop radio sounds the same. It's 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 kind oh. of uh, it, it's homo homogenized, generic, if you will. And I have to tell you, I haven't turned on. I have my CDs in my car. I haven't turned on the radio in probably fifteen years. Uh -huh. that's because there was, I know there's no point. Uh, my son, you know, stays very up on um, music today and he finds very little. Uh, we don't have the same taste, but he's definitely uh, more out there than I am as far as hearing what the latest is. Um, I just haven't been enticed by anything, hardly. I'll make a recommendation to you. I had recently Josie Cotton on the radio show here on the, on the outhouse lounge here. We talked about her new record company, kitten robot records. Mm -hmm. You ever get a chance to listen to kitten robot records. The bands are, are the talent is varied. They have a lot of the 60s, 70s influence. They have the early, they even have the B movie soundtrack influence. Some of them, others have uh, more of an eighties influence, but there, she found some, she has found some real talent uh, lying around. And, awesome. And, Really, there are real artists like her who are trying to find good talent and bring them to the forefront. Unfortunately, the radio and, and record industry, uh, no, I call I use record for the lack of a, uh, a term. Let's call it the radio and download industry. <laughs> there we go, the radio and download right. industry. And I, I feel actually my heart goes out to musicians right. uh, today because I know that there are plenty of them that are incredibly talented and would really like to make that be their life and it's close to impossible anymore. Um, even the big bands, the big, big, huge ones, when you talk to them about touring, like I talked to Alice, uh, uh, Alice came to town and I hadn't seen him in 40 years and I've got, we've got a real history with Alice Cooper and we just went down. It was after a show and we just went down old home week, you know, cause he, he wasn't, he was a big part of the Detroit scene too. Um, and we were discussing, you know, just even what it costs him to go on tour, hmm. what the actual cost is now, why the ticket prices are so high and it's insanity. Yeah. Plus, we always wonder about that. Uh, the, oh, I, the ticket prices are high, but they don't, they, the artists don't get paid no. by the venue. No, the artist has to pull in the money in Europe in many places. And this is what the artists will tell you in Europe. They pay the artist. They feed you. They put you up in some instances, depending on how big you are, but at least they pay you. Here, yeah. you have to pull in the gate. There's, It's Bullshit. almost like the economics hurt because even – that I, I, you can say that here because that's in context. It's yeah. true. It's bull nose. I mean <laughs> – No, it is. It is. It's, yeah. it's ridiculous. I mean – it, it's hard enough to be a musician. A lot of them have to have until they make it big. A lot of them have to have normal jobs. My son worked. My son worked two and three jobs just to afford his drums. You know the kits he needed and the, the equipment and blah blah blah. But no, I, I my heart goes out to uh, musicians because I don't think there's not really a rock scene anymore, and there's not here. I can tell you that our rock it's scene. Dead. Uh, the industry killed rock. I I hate to say rock. We could bring it back if we wanted to, but it's not going to get radio airplay. What we have is this sort of, and I'm not even saying soft rock because soft rock to me was the good stuff from the seventies. I'm hearing this kind of wimpy, I, I'll call it soy rock, if you will. Yeah. You have these terrible rock bands who are just kind of putting out this mellow sound that everybody else is. And they may be trying to sound exciting with that. And I'm going to say it again, the millennial whoop, the, Oh, Oh, oh. That hurts my ears to even think I about. Know, I know. But, but I rock, creativity and rock is dead. The, the rock, uh, the, the long rock song is dead. The, mm -hmm. uh, the story song is dead. The, the, the rock anthems, they no longer exist. You are correct. I couldn't agree with you more. And I cannot tell you how grateful I am that I lived the era I did live. Because I really did get, I, I really can't think of a band that I thought sucked. Well, honestly, every band I saw that, I mean, that got, you know, somewhat of a name even like canned heat. They're not my thing, but they, they were good. You know, so you just have all these bands, Grand Funk Railroad, forget it. Should have been mega. You know, there's just obviously Seeger. He did go mega. Alice Cooper's still going, you know, but there, I had an appreciate. And then the English bands, you know, Led Zeppelin. I got to jam with Led Zeppelin. I mean, you, you, you gotta be kidding. Oh, no, wait, 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 stop, stop, stop. I got, I, I, this is something that my listeners would stop me and say, or put in the comments, Hey, 
Chris, you didn't ask her about this. You jammed. Not only did you remember, not only were you the female Robert Plant, but you jammed with <laughs> Led Zeppelin. So tell us more about that. Okay. So there are a couple stories. Okay. So Led Zeppelin, uh, when he came, when, when they came to town, we partied with them every time and, and partying to us was just showing up. We didn't do the drugs. We weren't into the socks. We didn't do any of that, but we were there and got to see plenty of it. But anyway, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how I escaped being so young, not being influenced, but I wasn't. So uh, Led Zeppelin, they uh, played at Olympia, which was the venue to play for the, the, the stadium band. And um, what happened was uh, we had already, you know, partied with them the night before. They VIP'd us, of course. So we went backstage and Stairway to Heaven, this is such a great memory for me. Stairway to Heaven had just come out and it was like huge. And we were backstage. I dated Robert Plant. Oh, well, that's another thing we should be talking about. <laughs> so the female Robert Plant dated the real Robert they, Plant. Uh, yeah. So he, uh, the, Jimmy was backstage, me and Patty, uh, it was my sister Patty who plays guitar. We were backstage and Jimmy started playing Stairway to Heaven, offered Patty a guitar. She started jamming that with him. And then Robert started singing it. And then it's one of my favorite memories of all. I'm sitting, I didn't realize what it really meant back then, it just didn't hit me. But now that I look back, I think how many people can say they sang with Robert Plant and Patty played with to Stairway to Heaven backstage, just jamming it out. It was like, now it's just such an incredible memory to me. But yeah. It's, it, not many people can say that, even professional musicians exactly. like yourselves. And it's such an iconic song. I mean, every guitar player learns Stairway to Heaven. So the male Robert Plant wanted to meet the female Robert Plant, I suppose. One of the <laughs> all four dogs back then, so I'm sure, he did. And, you know, I'm sure it's just anything with a crotch. You know what I mean? Oh, but, boy. <laughs> there's so many. Uh, Mountain, we, Mountain was the first band. We, we opened for them at Easttown. Mississippi Queen had just been a hit. And while we were doing our, um, oh God, why is it slipping my mind? Before you start, what do you call it? Oh, uh, the uh, the thing you do before you begin. That's what I yeah. call it. Sound check. We were doing <laughs> oh, that's it. Yeah. And, the, and they were there, you know, they had arrived. And Leslie was standing at the side of the stage and he was just listening. And we got off and he was like, you know, you, he didn't say you guys are good for girls. He said, you guys are going to knock the pants off these guy bands. So we were like, yay, what do you know? Someone who has actually some credibility because they're bigger uh, complimented us. Well, it became a lifelong friendship, honestly. He really loved Cradle. He thought we were awesome. So they would come, when they'd come to town, we saw them every single time. In fact, I would go to New York City at 16 years old. I would fly there on my own just to close shop get the newest clothes. And I would stay with Corky Lang, the drummer at his Greenwich, Greenwich village apartment. So they would come to our house. My mom would make spaghetti. Um, and it, our house was, that's how our house was. It was like an incoming nonstop. I mean, I really need to write a book. <laughs> I, it has to happen. I know. It's just finding the time. It's not that I'm not inspired. It's finding the time, but uh, Leslie, I saw Leslie, of course he's passed away now, but I saw him, um, this was about seven years ago and I hadn't seen him since those days. And so he VIP'd me. I went, he was, you know, like, yes, come. So we went and we were, we were talking about old memories and he said, one of my favorite memories of all time, he said, I talked about this on the Howard Stern show. He said, I'll never forget it. There was a place where we lived in Gross Point. There was a place called the War Memorial. And in front of the War Memorial, very, Gross Point is very wealthy. So it's, you know, really extravagant. In front of the War Memorial, there are, you know, the shrubs that are made, made into a maze. Yes. yes. He took them there after a show one night. I, they said, you know, what can we do? Because it was late enough where nothing was open anymore. And I said, let's go play hide and go seek at the War Memorial. <laughs> 
And that's what we did. We went there and played hide and go seek. I mean, they're all stoned. I don't even know how they played, you know, but he said that was one of the most fun nights I've ever had in my life was that night. And he talked about it on Howard Stern. I had no idea that he thought it was that much fun, but he said, you have no idea. Well, hide and seek at a place called Gross Point sounds absolutely fantastic. It was. For those of you who are listening out there, you know a rich area when they have a word in it with a silent E. It's just a requirement for a very rich area. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I had I had a friend who had a house that was 22,000 square feet with an elevator and a ballroom. We didn't live like that, but I mean, we lived in Gross Point. But it is very wealthy, no doubt. But it has its normal such a, I don't know how our neighbors, I don't even know how they stood it because our house was nonstop. We practiced in the garage. Uh, I mean, my mom would complain because the pots and pans were rattling out of the kitchen cover. <laughs> Couldn't keep them in there. <laughs> but the bands came over and jammed Jefferson Airplane. Uh, they came over. Uh, they were all on acid. And we That's were, in the, yeah, yeah, we were in the garage at like three in the morning. My dad, of course, has to get up for work. My dad was famous for wearing black crew socks with uh, his his underwear were his trunks, you know, the long trunks. And so he would have been great for the outhouse lounge here. We that's the, that's the required attire unless you have a leisure suit. Yeah, so he would walk around like that. And these, the, we were in the garage, and I don't even know why because my dad's Italian and he does have a temper when he gets <laughs> when he gets mad. He didn't ever, ever get mad, but when he did. So we're in there jamming. At, it's like four in the morning by then. And my dad, uh, we woke my dad. He come, he pulls that door, the garage door open, and then he's pissed. <laughs> <laughs> what the hell are you doing out here? It's four in the morning. And then he looks at the musicians, and he all of a sudden his whole mood changes. And he says, you guys know B-flat blues? Nice. And they're all, they're all like, oh, yeah. He comes out in his underwear, socks, and the wife beater and jams at the organ with him. Oh, no, that's great. That it, That's a fantastic family story. It, yeah, it was awesome. I mean, it was music. So my dad was like, oh, I don't care what time of the morning is. I'm doing it. I'm, I'm pretty sure he had those times where he would be thinking, what would I go outside? Should I go outside and yell at these kids and go, stop that infernal racket right now? Or should I just nurture their talent? Yeah, my dad was, <laughs> my both of my parents, they, they let you have free reign to live what would make you happy. And and they were strong parents as far as, you know, direction and and opinion. I don't want to call them liberal because they weren't liberal, but they, they but were- There's a different definition today than maybe back then. Exactly. Because I was more liberal back then and I wouldn't, uh, but I had a lot of values. So it's a different liberal now. But uh, yeah, uh, Ted Nugent, um, he was my first boyfriend, you know that. That's and, um, he, uh, we had a car chase. It's something else I'll never forget. Uh, Born to be Wild by Steppenwolf. Oh, I remember and, uh, that song. Yes. Oh my God. I loved that song. Well, wait, 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 wait. We had a car chase. That's who we're going here. <laughs> <laughs> we had, uh, I snuck out of the house to Ted pick me up in his limousine. And I, so I snuck out my window and my dad caught me Oh no! and it became a car chase. My dad got hops in his Cadillac and Nugent's going about a hundred miles an hour in a 35 mile an hour zone, trying to get away from my dad. <laughs> and he born to me wild comes on and he hikes up that song and he's pounding the steel. Steering wheel. <laughs> I'm just like, this is fun. <laughs> my dad, Tried to ground me when I did finally get home. My dad, he didn't catch us. Um, oh, he did. He, did he try to catch you? Did he try to pull oh, the hundred yeah. miles an hour on the road? Oh yeah, he he stood right with us. And oh. then uh, when I did finally get home, he did try to ground me, but I had a gig the next week, so he couldn't. Oh, there we go. <laughs> that, that that's a that's one of the best Ted Nugent stories I've ever heard. I, yeah, I talked to Ted because uh, we text every now and then. But I talked to him. It had really been. I wanted him for my documentary. I wanted him to be one of the people I speak to. I had Roger Daltrey. I had so many people lined up that all said yes, Alice. And that's another reason I thought, you know, this documentary, I mean, I've got notables in here, you know, that could are going to speak about Detroit and my brother. And um, when it I called him, yes. I, I, I don't know how I even found this number, but I did. I, I had enough connections to get his private number. And 
Uh, I hadn't talked to him in 40 years. That's a long time. So the phone rings and it's not the number I called him on because I do screen all my phone calls. And my husband said, I said, I don't know. I feel like I should answer this one. And he said, yeah, go ahead. Because I had just texted him, but it wasn't the same number. He calls me up and he, the first thing he said is, Nancy Quattro, you skinny effing bitch. <laughs> <laughs> I said, uh, bitch, yes, not skinny. <laughs> <laughs> That's changed. <laughs> and then we went down old home week and he of course said yes on board for the documentary. But he he actually I said, Do you remember the car chase with my dad? Because I was 15. That's a long time ago. And he's experienced a lot. I didn't think he'd remember, but he said, Oh my God, that was fun. And he said, Born to be wild. He remembered every drop of it. So I was I was shocked. But you know what? It was a hectic time back then. It was a heavy political time. It was a great time of unrest, but it was the most powerful to, I'd go back in a heartbeat if I could. And you guys powerful. didn't get pulled over either. No, <laughs> uh, I just think it was, I'm so glad I got to live that generation. I really am. I suppose a lot of uh, young, young people would, would look at this two different ways. I mean, that looked like a lot of fun or that's way too scary for me. I, I understand that. But well, you lived yeah. it, and I got to tell you, running a hundred some odd miles an hour on the on the uh, on the road, uh, you have you with Ted Nugent. Your father is chasing you, and think and probably <laughs> now being a tiny, he's probably unloading every curse word in the book trying to catch oh, yeah. up going a hundred yeah. miles an hour. It, it must bad. not have been fun coming home. <laughs> no, uh, he was um, he was waiting, of course. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want you hanging out with that Ted oh, Nugent again. <laughs> Yeah, he's grounded going with the, and he, it was so funny because all my dad was exposed to was long haired hippies. I mean, everyone that came to the house, you know, the long haired hippie. And I thought, you, you don't even care about that. Why do you, because he had, uh, my brother, when he brought Jimi Hendrix, uh, that was my first rock concert. And that was the biggest influence, single influence on me in my whole life for music was I didn't even know who he was. And he comes barreling out of that stage from behind the curtain into Purple Haze with the guitar. And from then on, I was like, what is this? A whole new world opened for me. But my dad had to pick him up from the airport and he was high as a kite. And my dad bitched about it for a, a good <laughs> week. <laughs> pot in the limousine. My brother had like three limousines. So he was, Hendrix was, you know, and my dad... It was definitely not a drug family, and it definitely was not a uh, alcohol family. So it was real that part of it, you know. But that was the rock and roll world. That just was. I mean, we were the only ones I knew that didn't do drugs. Yeah, that's understandable. It's, a lot of these guys were influenced. They just said the other guys are doing it. I'm going to do it. How did you stay out of that peer pressure anyway? I mean, you mentioned it a couple of times. Yeah. But how, um, how did how did you kind of rise above it, if you will? Okay, so for me, it wasn't hard. It, was, it wasn't even an option to me. I had a healthy fear of drugs. I don't like to feel out of control, and I didn't want a chance that I'd feel out of control. Um, I saw a lot of damage. It actually turned me off to see what people became, or uh, I was backstage, cream was coming on, and uh, they were waiting for Jack Bruce to walk out there, and I walked by his dressing room, and there's a needle hanging out of his arm. And oh, I'm just man. what a waste, what a waste. Hendrix dying freaked me out. I just thought, well, I don't get the point of the drugs. I I had so much fun without drugs. And I just don't choose to be, I never drank either. I just don't choose to be inebriated. I like to be, I like to be ensconced in reality. Like, but now I wish I liked drugs because I would take drugs now. I think you need it now just to get through, uh, yeah. to get through reading the newspaper, or watching network television news every once in a while or, or, or cable yeah. news. There we go. I not be in twilight zone because that's what I feel I meant. But yeah, uh, I, it really, it just was not an issue for me. I smoke, I smoked pot. I'm not going to lie about that. It doesn't count. I don't count pot as I don't drugs. even, that was very different back then. It really was different. It was kind of homegrown and, and it, not at all what it is today. It was natural. Uh, it would, it, yeah, it just wasn't. And I liked it for the little bit that I did it, but you know, I, I just never took to drugs, never wanted to. I would never be a good drug addict for one main reason. I'd be a horrible heroin addict. I'm deathly afraid of needles. Oh, I know. Just never happening. I, I, I can't, I can't do it. I, 
Yeah. I, it, it hurt. They hurt. I'm sorry. They hurt. Yeah. I, I'm not afraid of needles, but I, I can't. Uh, our drummer, after Susie left the band to go to England, our female drummer, um, she's now passed away, but she was addicted to heroin. So that was our first wow, okay, uh, to deal with. And it wasn't easy. And, and I honestly, I get why Nugent has a strong stance on no drug taking in his, if you're in his band. If you are, he, you're just kicked out. And, and I don't blame him. Well, that's the way he wants to run his band. And, and that makes a lot of sense. It does ruin lives. Taking a, it's We've lost a lot of great talent and a lot of good people who have succumbed to um, succumbed to the world of drugs. I just, uh, I, I understand. And you got to see it. And I guess, I guess watching it and seeing these things happen to people had enough of, of an effect on you to just not do it. Not that, but you know what's funny, yeah. Chris, honestly, because before I joined the band, uh, when I was 13, all my friends were, that's when drugs were really becoming prevalent. And all my friends were doing, it. I mean, all my friends were dropping acid and blah, blah, blah. Um, so I wasn't in the band yet. I, I I think it's just me being who I am. I'm I'm naturally rebellious. I really am. But I'm not going to do something that I'm not really comfortable with. I'm just not. <laughs> it's something serious like that. So I think having a healthy fear of them, I always had a healthy fear. And that's a good thing. Uh, yeah. I do want to mention one more thing. Uh, the Detroit music scene is still pretty darn good. That's one thing that's, we talked about how rock has been dying and everything else. We don't see punk music anymore. And I, and I, I talked to a few people about, well, there's still punk music out there. There's no punk is not punk anymore. If you're playing for the, like, like rage for the machine, you're, you're playing uh, pro establishment music and, and cheering on the government. You are not punk. You're the opposite of punk. That's right. It's anarchy. But Detroit still has great music coming out of that. I, I want to throw out some names, obviously. Nikki Corvette is still, uh, is still playing and singing. Uh, you have uh, Amy Gore has uh, continues to put out some good music out there, and uh, and and you have a lot of really really good bands that are local. I I got to see through both of them actually, uh, having them on past programs. This uh, there it's it's fascinating how there are some quarters around the country where you can still find some really really good rock. I'm sure there are. It's just not out in the forefront like it right. used to be, and there it's not the. The, 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 uh, like our music scene in Dallas, the bars basically there you, you you could go probably through twenty bars that all have rock bands playing. There's zero. There's like one one left that is actually playing, hiring bands and playing rock music. It's really rare. Detroit. I do talk to my uh, friends that are my age that were in the scene very heavily, and like Jim McCarty, he's a guitarist. Um, there are quite a few of them, and I ask them. I we talk like once a year. How is the scene now? And basically, what they tell me is there isn't one in Detroit. Hmm. That's what they tell me. Now I don't know if it's because they're the age they are, you know, and maybe not getting hired like the young ones do. I don't know. But Jim McCarty has quite a big name. I mean, we got Johnny Badanjic, the drummer, who's outrageously incredible uh these are all the names from back then you know mitch Ryder, all them but i from what they tell me uh they it's not anything close to what it was it probably wouldn't be because a lot of them went national and and uh and were able to go to bigger and better things a lot of local bands will just break up after a while or a lot of these guys have to do uh, some regular jobs while they put out their music I have yeah. heard some great stuff out of Detroit, to be honest with you. Yeah, At this I, point, maybe your friends are saying the scene's not as big as it used to be, but you yeah. do have some good stuff coming out there. I'll, I'll contend to that. But Detroit will always have great music because you have a whole different type of people that live there. It's, it's different. When I go there, when I fly back there, I am instantly home. I don't care. I've lived here longer now than I have, did there. I lived there 29 years, born and raised. But... When I go back to Detroit, I'm home. I relate to the people. Not, well, I do. The musician <laughs> and, people. And no cowboy fans. Uh, not the, um, <laughs> that's a whole other subject. Uh, imagine that, going from Detroit with the Lions and, and going to Dallas and having to deal with all those cowboy fans. Yeah. And, the, and a lot of the cowboy fans my age. These are people who were watching the Cowboys win all those games in the in the seventies, wearing their little feety pajamas and saying, "Oh, the star! Oh, that's so cool! I, I want my team to have a star as the logo." 
And yeah. that's where they became a phenomenon. And they haven't really done much since. Yeah, my son's a huge. I mean, he puts all the, you know, the shirts on and what they're playing. My son loves the cowboy. He just, uh, oh, he just had to take care of uh, Dak Prescott. Is that his name? Yes, the, the quarter, that's that's got to hurt. I like Dak. Dak was a good quarterback, though. Well, he he said, "Mom, you could not be," because he works for the Texas Rangers. My son, and he said, "You could not meet a, a nicer guy than Dak." He said he's just so uh, down to earth. He said, "Really lovely, you know." Always gives Michael a hug, and I mean, all Michael does is make sure his food's right, you know. <laughs> but he, <laughs> he he's very, very, uh, very down to earth, and you wouldn't know he is who he is. Oh, yeah, the yeah. Rangers are having a good year too, so that's all good. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's been, a, it's been a while for them. Yes. Oh, yeah. I worked for them for ten, uh, seven years. Wow! Did you work for the really? Yeah, and then I went on to I opened up the fine dining restaurant. Had to deal with the Ranger wives. I, yeah, I worked there seven years at the uh, stadium, and then I moved on to um, American Airlines Center where the Mavericks and the Stars play. And Mo I opened up. I work directly with Mark Cuban. I opened up his club. Well, that's interesting. But that's now we have to talk sports right. on the next show. Yeah. That's <laughs> right. I mean, you know, I, I've done, obviously, you know, I'm still looking for work. So yeah, well, we're always looking for work here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm still forging. I'm still forging a career in radio, or at least trying to do that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Nancy Quattro Glass, thank you very much for being with me on the Outhouse Lounge. Thank you. I totally enjoyed it. <laughs> Be well, and thank you all for joining us. Enjoy your day, and yes, keep listening to great music. Yes, that's a must. Bye.